Oh, I like the way you receive me. <laughs> shalom, shalom. Hala Hadassah here. I am coming before you today by the grace of Hashem to speak on the divine feminine in Torah and Kabbalah, the divine feminine principle known as the Shekhinah or the Shekhinah. Now, I'm actually in the midst of writing a book, compiling a book of essays and poetry, of prose and other musings called Mother God or Mother of Gods, Divine Femininity in Torah and the Kabbalah. So this discussion will serve as an introduction to some of the concepts that I will be introducing and elucidating in the book to come. So before beginning the discussion about Shekhinah, the divine feminine aspect of the creator, I would like to recite a very small poem. It begins, is our creator humble? having constricted himself? Is our creator modest, having concealed himself? Yes. Now how much more should you be? As in heaven or under heaven, there are none so like him as ourselves. A verse from Mishli, the Proverbs of King Solomon, accompanies this for its relevance. When arrogance appears, disgrace follows, but wisdom is with those who are unassuming. Mishli 11 and 2. When we speak of the creator constricting and concealing himself, this concept Kabbalistically is known as, as the simsum. The simsum is the idea that the creator in his infinite light, his limitless being, desired differentiation and the formation of creation as we know it and even beyond what we can comprehend served the most high to be able to have a reflection of himself to gaze upon even to long for and to seek to engage with and through which he would reveal himself back to himself by revealing himself through his creation, quite the paradox. This reflective relationship is what mankind was created to emulate. We as mankind and Israel in particular, as Hashem's chosen lineage are the bride that must passionately long for, intensely desire, and unflaggingly pursue the Most High as a bride awaits and seeks her groom. We must first understand that the universe is comprised with, and the progress of the universe is contingent upon the meeting of complements. So everything that is life, everything that exists, hence everything that is the creator, exists dependent upon the dynamism of complementary energies constantly meeting and harmonizing in the reflective relationship that itself reflects and emulates the creator's relationship with his creation. Indeed, the purpose of creation, especially for humanity, and most particularly for his chosen people is to emulate the creator in all of his ways. To be the vessels that merit to earn the privilege of embodying creator's divine attributes and through this emulation, bringing him down to the physical realm to engage with his creation through us and through us and as us, his light 
scattered and disseminated as individual sparks, we spread his light throughout the physical realm, which was tohu wafohu, chaotic, void, and without form before he shaped it. The concept of the tsimsum is a concept of descent, most particularly the necessity of a descent that predicates an ascent. We must descend to ascent. We must lower ourselves, humble ourselves, to then be elevated to the throne. It is the humble servant, ironically and paradoxically, that inherits the throne and the kingdom. Herein lies the secret. Humility is the attribute that invites the Shekhinah to dwell among us in this realm. The Shekhinah is the feminine aspect of the creator. The creator, the limitless, indefinable, incomprehensibly vast and majestic is Ein Sof. His limitless light, Or Ein Sof, is that which was constricted and that in itself was the altruism through which the infinite, unfathomable creator was beneficent and benevolent enough to condense and lower himself in order to share himself with his creation. And indeed, most potently, to share himself with creation as and through us as humans and as Israel specifically. This gift of himself required concealing of himself that he be revealed through us. We all no doubt know the scripture, this idea of this constant and perpetual pattern of descending and ascending, descending and reascending, birth, death, and rebirth is reflected in the Torah through the patterns of the descent of messianic consciousness. Now we all know of the Mashiach that is to come. Indeed, the Mashiach that is to return. The Mashiach that is to come again. However, many may not quite be aware that the Mashiach is here. The Mashiach exists in every generation. In every generation, there is a, there is a tzaddik, a righteous one. Indeed, 39 righteous ones existing at any given time, at any given place in the earth, scattered. And one of those 39 is Mashiach, waiting to reveal himself in each generation. An interesting phenomenon that recurs throughout Torah is the reincarnation of Mashiach, the reincarnation of vessels that are endowed with and embody the messianic consciousness. Moshe, Moses, being one of the most memorable, revered, and remarkable. And indeed, all of the patriarchs represented the righteousness of the messianic consciousness in one way or another, particularly Yitzhak Yaakov, Moshe, David HaMelech, King David, Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, and all the way down to Mashiach Yeshua. Controversially, perhaps, even feminine vessels served to embody and incarnate the messianic consciousness. Hadassah, Queen Esther, is interpreted by scholars as being a feminine Mashiach a deliverer of her people. Even Chawa can be interpreted as such. Even Ruth, the vessel through which messianic lineage 
was born, even Sarah, Sarah. The decent and ascent is also mirrored in other spiritual beliefs, most prevalently and most widely known being the archetypal journey of the descent of Inanya, the Sumerian Mesopotamian deity who as a queen lowered herself, humbled herself and descended into the underworld along her journey at each step of the way, removing piece by piece more of her regalia, her adornments, her royal garbs, even her names and titles. This represents archetypally from a Jungian perspective, this journey that we all take through life. We are humbled where we undergo the paradigm shift and the dark nights of the soul in which everything we thought we knew, everything we thought we were, every role ascribed to us by society and even family must be stripped away as they are illusions of the ego that some may liken to the klipa, the klipot, the husks that separate us from truly embodying Hashem's highest attributes and cloud our vision and our ability, obscure our ability to perceive ourselves as a reflection of Hashem and to recognize Hashem within us. So this stripping away of these husks, these illusions, these delusions, these egoic desires, ambitions, and roles leaves us naked and vulnerable. Yet if we do this right, naked and unashamed, as Adam and Chawa were before the eating of the fruit and the fall. Inanya in her descent later was able to reascend back to her throne, restored with more beauty and splendor than ever before. However, in this restoration, she was elevated to a position of authenticity. And all of her splendor then came from an authentic place rather than an scribed place. This journey is a representation of our relationship with the Shekhinah, the divine feminine aspect of the creator that descends to the earth, even fluttering expansively over the chaos, the void, the darkness of our ignorance, like the Ruach fluttering in Bereshit One above the primordial waters. This Shekinah flutters expansively over the ignorance that clouds our recognition of Hashem in the physical world. And it is through her that wisdom and revelation is imparted. Humility being the prerequisite to receive revelation and even attain the prophetic estate. When we understand Kabbalistically Etz Chaim, the tree of life, and the climbing of Etz Chaim through the 32 paths of wisdom connecting the Seferot, the emanations of Hashem's divine attributes. We are able, we are able likewise to understand more of the esoteric meaning behind Sulam Yahov, Jacob's ladder. The ascent and descent of the angels Yahov perceived at heaven's gate were ascending from his inner being reaching heaven and returning, redescending in order to impart to him the wisdom that they had collected to bring back from Hashemayim. Indeed, Yahov, who sent messengers to Esau, had indeed sent angels, Malachim, with his words. That speaks to the power of our words. Our words as messages create messengers literal Malachim that go out into the world and act accordingly to the intentions framed in those words. 
Therefore, we send them on assignment to manifest what we will. For from the heart, the man speaks. And our heart's desire is revealed in our words. Shekinah represents the Mahut on the tree of life. Mahut is the kingdom. Where does a king dwell? But in his kingdom. In Shemot 25 and 9, Exodus 25 and 9, Hashem calls upon Yitzrael to make him a sanctuary to dwell in. However, is this a physical location, a physical building, a physical temple, an edifice constructed out of wood and stone? Indeed, the Mishkan, which we hear in the Shekhinah, the Mishkan, which we hear clearly in itself, is an echo of the Shekhinah, the Mishkan, in which etymologically we hear an echo of the Shekhinah is the dwelling place within for Hashem. Our being is the dwelling place. When he says, make me a sanctuary in which I shall dwell, it was Israel, it was us individually and collectively to make his dwelling place within us, within our body temples, within our hearts, within our minds. This being what we are implored in the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, Wa'achavta et Adonai Elohecha, Bakal Lavavcha, Ufkal Nafshecha, Ufkal Meodecha, you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart, mind, and being, with all your strength, with all your substance, with every aspect of your existence. Therefore, we elevate the mundane in this physical world by bringing glory to him in every single thing that we do. That's why the mitzvot, each of the 613 mitzvot, correspond to a different part of the body, as even individually we are all parts of the collective body of his bride. And through this body, we engage this physical world. And this body is the temple, the physical world vessel through which Hashem engages this world. We are his body. We are his edifice. Mishkan is the place wherein Hashem settles to dwell among the people. The Mishkan of the self, the temple of the self, Hashem dwells so that he may, through us loving our neighbor as ourselves, engage his creation through us as we reflect one another. This brings us back to the Shekhinah. What is the Shekhinah? The presence or dwelling, covering or unencompassing. Like a woman, anatomically or emotionally, is a dwelling or a home in which a man dwells, a dwelling or a home for a man to occupy a dwelling or home for a man to rest in, home in which the man, as king of his castle, dwells among his people. Indeed, his wife and his children, my people, the people he serves. For truly, royalty is a position of service. The authority of a king is the authority to serve. He serves by, he serves by protecting and providing for He provides for, protects, and prospers his family, his household, just as a king does for his people, his kingdom. By definition, the vagina of a woman is a sheath or a scabbard in which a sword or blade is kept a place where a sword comes to rest. A man finds in a woman's heart, her mind, her body, and her soul, a place of maternal nourishing and nurturing, a safe space, a sacred place to rest in and lay down his sword and shield, allowing himself to be vulnerable, share himself. Like Hashem, man descends into the woman and shares himself altruistically in his most gentle giving 
and sensitive state of benevolence. For indeed, the masculine principle is the giving principle, whereas the feminine is the receiver, the receptive receptacle. Woman is a place where man settles. Woman is a man's home. Man, like Hashem, constricts and descends into the woman, making himself smaller and softer to share himself with her. While the woman expands, and indeed the Shekhinah, the function of the Shekhinah is to make space for Hashem to dwell in our hearts through the impartation of revelation of him that brings bina understanding, which is itself feminine. The woman expands to accommodate the man, opening to make room for him, and ascends and elevates. Women in the throes of orgasm and ecstasy may indeed convey a feeling akin to dancing, floating, or levitation, suspended between worlds, as a hovering above, like the Ruach, hovering, fluttering over the deep with the kosher wife or the righteous woman, the Eshet Kayu, that a man truly elevates spiritually and refines his character, rectifies his middle. It is through a woman and through marriage that a man engages in the working of the highest soul tikkun and teshuvah. Well, I will leave with this, continue speaking on Shekhinah and expounding more upon the role of the Shekhinah yeah. through Torah and Kabbalah. I hope you have enjoyed this transmission and Hashem willing, I will have the opportunity to share more with you. Shalom.